<laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. I'd forgotten that we were together in January, and everybody's looking forward. And with great pride, I kind of want to look a little bit back, because it just dawned on me fairly recently uh, at the progress we've made. Um, and when I, when I comment on all these points, uh, I want you to understand that there's a hell of a great team behind us that makes this happen. But let me bring you up to speed on Coldwater Creek. Uh, Coldwater Creek is at 3,400 yards out or feet out into the lake uh, with a goal of 46. So within two weeks the burn will be done. Simultaneously we've told you already that the treatment train itself is pretty well constructed. We're waiting for spring and some more planting. Uh, some of that planting is already done. But now we're working on the discharge uh, culvert that will parallel um, Johnson Road from the south end of the treatment train down to Grassy Creek. Uh, many of you don't realize that that little wetlands uh, on 127, right there where used to be out Ollinger's place, um, is called Grassy Creek, and that's a, a neat little wetlands right there. Um, and, and so we're right now we're up to Ray and Rita Feltz's house, which is the southerly most house uh, in that subdivision all along Johnson Road. And I do want to spend just a moment to thank them profusely. Um, we needed an easement uh, to get our discharge culvert from the treatment train into the public right away, which is the side ditch, and, and we've reached out to some other players and, and to not a very favorable response, and we talked to Ray and Rita, and they said, look, it's good for the lake, do what you got to do. And even to the point that on the south side of their property, they have this wonderful pine windbreak, and says, hey, if it's got to go, it's got to go, it's good for the lake. And, and that's the kind of spirit of cooperation that we see so often. So. If you know the Feltzes, um, on our behalf, thank them profusely because they sure made what seemingly was going to be an awkward situation into a very, very easy one. Okay, so in four years, and let me give you a little perspective on that. I know it's a full agenda, but I want you to hear this. Um, you know, we formed roughly in 2010 when the lake got sick, meaning the LRC, and then it took us a year to do some fundraising, get our feet wet, and develop our master plan. So we kind of benchmarked 2012 as really hitting the ground running. So in that time, I want you to understand that Prairie Creek has been built, established, and doubled in size. Beaver Creek will be done this spring and functional as soon as the vegetation goes going. Coldwater Creek, which will encompass Grassy Creek, will be done. And I'm going to show you a schematic here in a second that we've come up with a plan. Uh, it's very preliminary. Uh, it's got some moving parts to it that we have to hit. Uh, but we think we can kill two birds with one stone uh, in one treatment train to capture both creeks. Um, and so that only leaves uh, Barnes Creek has yet to be done. And of all of our tributaries, Barnes is the healthiest. Um, and not that we're going to ignore it, but we took on the elephants first. So literally all of our tributaries coming into the lake will have a treatment train facility uh, literally within three years, and we're awfully proud of that. Uh, well, the other piece that we've discovered, and we're working on that as we speak, some of our critics have said with these treatment trains, well, you're only capturing or cleansing a portion of the water. Uh, we worked with ODNR and, and, and Tom, and as you probably know, uh, from Prairie Creek and now in Coldwater Creek, we, we've added that littoral wetlands piece at the discharge side of our treatment trains. Um, and, and we've discovered the fact that we think, and we're going to probably test it with Prairie, once that vegetation gets established and rooted firmly, that we can divert some, if not all, of the water from the flow of these tributaries through the wetlands uh, and then out into the lake. So that is the best of both worlds. Not only are you pumping, but you get flow through also. The other part of that is, so we, we protect the uh, boating traffic getting in and out. We just have to divert the entrance a little bit. But in most of the installations, that can be handled pretty readily. And the other thing I'm going to talk to you about this morning is uh, rough fish reduction. Uh, we're going to start a pilot in just a couple weeks. I'm going to show you about that. And kudos to Tom and his team hitting record proportions of dredging each and every year. So as you look at our master plan, uh, I think it's, it's pretty astounding uh, what's been accomplished in three years. And um, it, it, it result it means a better lake. And to that end, uh, you got the fish pictures.
Grand Lake is producing like crazy right now. These are pictures of uh, saw guy. Just go through them real quick there. From uh, Beaver Creek, south of the spill, or downstream from the spillway. One more. Uh, that's just some friends of mine in St. Mary's. What I didn't bring this morning is the crappie are turning on. They are uh, the same hogs they were last fall. Uh, and as I asked Dave and, and around his son, his son-in-law was out, and, and similar story there. But they're whacking them, and, and they're all huge, 11, 12-inch fish. Go ahead. Can you rotate that? No, no, don't pick it up. I mean, on the screen. Funny joker. No. You can't? Uh, apparently not. Isn't there an icon on top? Uh, My apologies. Okay, so at the risk of sending you to the chiropractor, you have to go like this. Dang it. Really? Okay. All right, bear with me. This, this is uh, Chickasaw Creek that at least preliminarily we're hoping um, is the red one the, the red thing yeah okay and I apologize I thought he could just rotate that and, and put it vertically but bottom line is this is the big chick this is the little chick they narrow right here to a manageable distance this is already owned by the state of Ohio and as an existing uh, riparian wetlands. So the concept would be is we'd put a lift station here on Little Chick, a lift station here on Big Chick, drawing from each. Uh, some of the moving parts is we want to talk to this landowner about buying some acreage here for the treatment train itself. Here comes the littoral wetland piece here. Uh, it, based on the success of Prairie Creek, this is Chickasaw Island, based on the success of Prairie Creek vegetation, that should explode once it's fed with healthy, clean vegetation. And then what we would do is cut through here to allow boating traffic, but then that would make that flow through that I was telling you about, um, which would be very cool. The, the part we can't talk about, because we don't know, is how long it will take the vegetation to march forward. And the same with Coldwater Creek. Uh, the goal there is down the road to make all of Coldwater flow through the goose farm and that wetlands once it's established. Uh, what we don't know is just how fast the vegetation will march forward. In Prairie Creek's case, uh, it didn't take long at all, uh, but we don't know that in, in each and every application. So you might have to come to my graveside to tell me about it, but eventually, uh, all the trips will have to flow through uh, a wetlands in addition to the pumping that we're doing. So it's a great deal of pride that I, that I tell you in general terms, geez, what a pace we've maintained. And it's, it's due to a lot of cooperation from the state of Ohio, the local DNR team, and the LRC team. And, and don't minimize the impact of the LA, LIA and its players because uh, we've moved right along at a very, very fast pace. Now to the exciting stuff, or at least I find it exciting. Um, when Brian's team a couple years ago put out the, the test net, or not test nets, but they, they put out nets for the cart, you know, and we had pictures in the paper. Well, I want you to see what we're bringing in. Uh, we uh, hooked up with uh, a guy by the name of Jeff Riedemann. And if you're into the Outdoor Channel and, and the History Channel and all those reality shows, he actually has a show called uh, Bottom Dwellers. So we met uh, Jeff, and he's been to the lake uh, through our, one of our consultants, and some progress and discussions and back and forth with Fish and Wildlife down in Columbus, and, and we finally got the, the green light. So what's going to happen is um, uh, next week, like the 13th, hopefully, depending on ice and lake conditions, uh, they will come in and run some nets with the goal being of catching 25 carp. Uh, and, and what they will do with those 25 carp. And keep in mind, this is a business for them. Uh, they will tag them with telemetry. Um, and then they will make sure they're going to survive, they're going to turn them back in the lake, and then wait a month while those carp find their buddies. Because what they have found in other lakes that they've worked is in the winter months, these fish group up. Uh, and again, it's a business. They want, they're going to a lot of expense to come to our lake, so they want the ability to harvest as many as they can. So then they will come back like an Aprilish, Marchish, 
that even a word? Um, and and look to do some real time harvesting. And I want to give you kind of a flavor because it's so darn interesting. This is a lake they did uh, in Oregon that was a a major wetlands for the flyway over there. And, and carp were introduced uh, back in the 20s to this area and they've devastated all the vegetation in this wetlands uh, and therefore the birds are stop, not stopping anymore and it's impacting um, the flyaway. And so they brought Riedemann in and, and I, I find it fascinating. Um, this is how they maneuver. So you want this? Yes. All right. All right, Jeff, we're going to try this out here. Uh, first time, so figure what This is kind of jerry rigged but you'll find it fascinating even if you can't hear it. This is important information for the science. Quantify the size of the population. So what they were doing was setting up after the first time. This is not going to work, go by. I'll just talk to you. Okay, so the gist of it is, they that telemetry into these fish, they located them, they went out with their nets, and look at this, this guy's got a, a bobcat with a net on, on a dang barge, and look at the massive quantities that they're dumping, this is from the net area to the right, and then into the barge to the left. And when I saw this initially, I rem it reminded me of the story of Brian's team went out the one year and they caught so many fish, they about sunk the, uh, um, the barge, but anyhow, the, the just the, the mechanics of that that little bobcat on a boat, for God's sake, scooping up carp, I thought was just fascinating. So we're hoping to have that success. Uh, clearly, we know uh, we cannot eradicate all the carp. We get that, uh, but if we can get them in balance in the lake, is the key that that all the experts are telling me. Um, uh, some guys down in Columbus from fishery are saying, based on their electroshocking, that we're at like 90% rough fish and only 10% game fish. Um, and if we can get those carp in balance with the game fish, <clears throat> which are predators, then they will take care of themselves. But more importantly, and it was the same way here, I love this video because it really makes our point, we are spending literally millions of dollars of taxpayers' dollars trying to reestablish wetlands. And these devastate wetlands, as you can see here. Um, and so we just have to make the All-American try. And we won't know till we try. So anyhow, Riedemann and his crew will be in here next week. We'll keep everybody uh, abreast of the situation. This effort would be, will be uh, trying to find some carp, at least 25 of them, tag them, turn them loose. And then in a couple months, I'm hoping and praying you see that kind of volume uh, being done, and, and we'll be giving tours at a mere $50 a head. <laughs> so if there's no questions, thank you very, very much. Uh, no. Oh, I'm sorry, yes? Um, I was trying to follow what you were saying about the Prairie Creek situation, the, the train and like that. Um, you were expanding the, the outlet, you say, the, the uh, wetland area outlet? Okay, I don't have, you don't have an old Prairie Creek diagram in the computer, do you? Well, I guess my, my concern was... Is Instead of going straight out, you would go to the left when you got so to the lake. So if you had a pontoon boat going out Prairie Creek, there wouldn't be any obstructions? No, 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 no. Okay. Well, when, when you get to the rock berm on your right that goes around to the boater's beach, okay? If you look to your left, right beside the LIA sign, there's a little channel and a little island, okay? We would dredge that out and take you around that island to get out be the only difference. And, and that's, you know, we don't know for sure when that's going to happen because to move the rock over to let the water into that installation is going to be done by barge probably. Probably. We have to engineer that out. So we might be a year or two away from that. But it will no way whatsoever impact the boating public getting in it. Because we're very cognizant of the fact that our tributaries are really thoroughfares to get into subdivisions. Plus, love lives on that, and he won't let us do that. One thing I'm not understanding, so they're tagging the fish, Yes. Putting them back into the lake. Yes. So then, what are they doing in the? I mean, what? 
what's the purpose of tagging them and putting them back? So, in? so you can find the masses, schools. the schools. Uh, the, what these guys bring to the table, they are rough fish harvesters as a company. And they've got it down, no pun intended, to a science. And what they've learned is in the winter months, these rough fish school up in big masses. So they want to go to those big schools to maximize the harvest. To find those schools, they need to find, and, and he showed me on his phone, these smartphones, Last time he was up here, they were working a lake in uh, North Dakota or South Dakota, one of them. And he showed me on his phone, there were these blue dots, like six of them. And he said, that's a big school, because they find each other. Okay, So we need to find the masses to maximize the take. And they do that through science. And then they go out with some sort of reading devices, sonar or whatever, to find those tags. Yes, sir? Do you know what market they're selling the cart to? A, a quasi yes, um, similar to Cooper's, you know they sell every bit and piece of a turkey. The turkey breast that you buy and, and the turkeys you buy in the store is just one small piece of it. Same way with these carp. Um, they sell the fillets to the east and west coast. Uh, big market there. Their their biggest profit margin uh, because when I initially met them, I said, look, we know from the Brian's team's success, you come here in the spring, just go on the shoreline and you'll fill boats. That's too late. Their most valuable product is the roe, the eggs, um, and they don't want them to be dumped, so to speak. And I don't know if you're a fisherman, but so many times in the spring, if you catch a fish that's full of eggs, their knee-jerk reaction is to dump those eggs when you take them out of the water, and they don't want that to happen. So they'll sell the skin, they'll sell the flays, they'll sell the roe, they told me that even the scales are used in these highway reflectors that are buried in the ground to keep you from going left and right, apparently. So. Aren't the fish somewhat contaminated? I mean, that's kind of what I picked up when I came down here. Uh, we don't know for positive. And we will certainly test them for consumption. But each and every year, the state of Ohio takes sampling of the other kinds of fish, bass, perch, walleye, crappie, and they've all tested fine. We've never tested the carp to the best of my knowledge simply because we didn't think there was a need until now. But they will be tested before um, there'll be mass collection. Sounds fishy to me, but... <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Jimmy. Yeah, where will they process them and how will they... Okay, when you saw the guys walking the boats uh, to the shoreline, they actually had, they bring a team in uh, that captures the row, flays them out, packs them on ice, and on the semis they go. Hopefully they're edible and they are out to the marketplace. They'll have contracts they'll want to fulfill, just like the farmers do with corn and grain. And, and, and if it, if it, what about in, the waste part of it? After they process them, what happens to them? You mean the guts and stuff? Yeah. I honestly don't know. Didn't ask them. But that's part of their package. They take care of the green Yeah, the, the, that's part of their package. And to give you kind of a flavor, j just for this pilot of coming in, tagging the fish and do what they do, mobilizing their boats and stuff, I had to raise $35,000. And that's part of their package. It's hands off for us. Uh, but I don't know that I can answer your question. It's going to be fun, if nothing else to see what's out there. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very, very much.